All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Emmaus Church. Come on in, and uh, if you're still out there, come on in and let's stand and sing. Spend some time singing uh, God's praises in this church and uh, getting ready for the service. So come on in and let's sing together. Every thirst and every need 
you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough you are my supply my breath of life still more awesome than I know you are my reward worth living for still more awesome than I know and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough oh, oh you're more than enough You're my sacrifice of greatest price Still more awesome than I know You're my coming King You are everything Still more awesome than I know And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough oh you're more than enough More than all I want, more than all I need. You are more than enough for me. More than all I know, more than all I can see. You are more than enough for me. More than all I want, more than all I need.
like salvation And this hope will never fail Cause heaven is our home Through every storm My soul will sing Jesus is here Through God be Let's sing this together, sing, I've decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before. cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back, oh Christ is enough for me, oh Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, oh Christ, is enough for me. Oh Christ, is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, everything. Oh, everything I need is in you. Everything I need. One more time, everything. Oh, everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Lord, we thank you. Lord, you didn't leave us without anything, Lord. But above all, Lord, you gave us yourself. Lord. We have you. If we have you, Lord, we have absolutely everything. Nothing else that we need in life, Lord, besides you. Lord, help us to live our life that way fully, Lord. Every single day, Lord. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. Welcome again this morning. Turn around and say hello to somebody that you haven't seen for at least seven days. Close to it anyways. Welcome again to an amazing Sunday time together. Looking forward to the continuation of Pastor Jim's uh, series on uh, Jordan Peterson Goes to Church. A few announcements before we get into that. Uh, our Christmas banquet, yes, we've been announcing it for a while and we're going to continue to announce it because we want you to be able to invite as many people as you possibly can uh, to our Christmas banquet. It is uh, right during our regular service time at 11 o'clock, so it's kind of like a lunch, really. Not really a dinner, it's a lunch. 
uh, but you can invite, you know, friends, enemies, and invite your enemies. They'll, they still like to eat, you know, so uh, bring somebody with you uh, and uh, uh, enjoy the time together. We're going to have gifts for the kids, as we always do. They're, even if the, there's ones that are here for the first time, there will be a gift for them underneath the, uh, the, the tree wrapped and ready uh, to give them, all right? So if you're bringing neighbors or something and they've got kids, don't, you know, hold back and say, no, what if they bring kids, maybe it'll be a problem. No, it'll be, uh, we're always prepared uh, for, uh, for guests and visitors on that day, all right? We do not have a sign-up sheet yet, but next Sunday, Dave, remind yourself, next Sunday you're bringing a sign-up sheet that's going to be there because we want to make sure we have enough meals. I think last time we had 150-plus meals from, uh, from Swiss Chalet that we had, had ordered. So uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared for, uh, for enough food. So uh, when that sign-up sheet's available, then uh, make sure you avail yourself of that. Uh, tomorrow uh, is Remembrance Day. Right, and we can see we've got some poppies that we see around the room. Uh, if we could take just take a, a minute, could we do that and just uh, have a moment of remembrance uh, for all those that have done so much uh, in the past for us? Thank you for that. We live in a great country that has great freedoms, and uh, we have them because there's a price that was paid. So we are very thankful for that. A few other things in your bulletins that you can uh, make yourself uh, aware of. Uh, and uh, we do have a special guest today uh, that is. Uh, <laughs> Para tu, para tu, para tu, Oh, oh, para mí. <laughs> para. Da. Ah. Oh, oh, para qué da. Babani, <laughs> ah, comfy, parak chica. Do we light? Numu, e uno tres, cuatro Saint George, Damalu, siete tres Vero. Patakuri moka. <laughs> moka tu? Masaru. Stadula? Sato so di foto. Paparon? E lovely. E bustaka. Yay! Yay! Ah, okay, okay? Okay? Uh. Nakari Batikano, Maluluku, Big Boss Cheryl. Bye bye. Good night, Edith. 
Good night, Margo. Oh, hold the horses. Who are you texting? My friend Avery. Avery. Hey, Avery. Is it a girl's name or a boy's name? Does it matter? No, no, it doesn't matter unless it's a boy. I know what makes you a boy. Who you do? Your bald head. Oh, yes. Sometimes I stare at it and imagine a little chick popping out. Good night, Agnes. Never get older. Mr. Gru, Agent Lucy Wilde of the Anti-Villain League. You're gonna have to come with me. Oh, sorry, I- Please, I- You know, you really should announce your weapons after you fire them. For example... <laughs> Lipstick taser! Get in there! <laughs> this looks like a plot for me, so everybody just follow me, cause we need a little controversy, cause it's been so good that we dedicated to fighting crime on a global scale. A new villain has surfaced. You know how a villain thinks. That's why we brought you here. Pins and needles. I am the League's director, Silas Ramsbottom. Bottom. Hilarious. Guess who's back? Are you really gonna save the world? Guys, right, baby! Crew's back in the game with cool cars, gadgets, How was it working? and weapons! <laughs> there you have it. There's a movie night coming up. You probably didn't know if that was connected to anything or not, but it is. There's a movie night coming up uh, on the 23rd uh, of this month, and uh, that's what uh, the minion that you've seen come through here, that's what they were trying to say. I, I got it all. I don't know if you did get it. Yeah, you got it all. Okay, uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Jim to come up. Well, good morning, friends. Good to have you here today, and welcome to Emmaus Church. Um, I haven't even seen the first Minions, so I can't recommend either of those movies, but it looks like uh, some people are going to have a lot of fun. Do you have to wear a costume, Sonia? Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to work on that one. Anyway, I don't really have an interesting segue into our time of confession or the Lord's Supper. There's, there's no sense even trying to fake it uh, at this point. So gather yourselves uh, together and uh, prepare to continue worshiping the Lord. It's our custom each Lord's Day to observe the Lord's Supper together. And as uh, Pastor Dave already led us in a time of uh, remembrance for those who, who have fallen, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of controversy in the news uh, this time around about Remembrance Day, and uh, it seems to have been followed on hard times. I learned that there were a couple of public schools that were being reprimanded because uh, they had said that they don't want to observe Remembrance Day anymore. Uh, apparently, it's not inclusive in some way that if you don't have Canadian descendants, that it, that it could be alienating to you. And I just think that it's a fine thing to uh, remember people who gave their lives for things they believed in. Whether there's, they are things that you believe in or not, there's something ennobling uh, about that, and, uh, but particularly as we come to the Lord's Supper. So uh, I would like to, I, I guess in a way of transitional moment, um, go ahead and, and uh, recite, as I sometimes do, uh, the poem by uh, Lieutenant John McRae, a Canadian World War I Army lieutenant who did not come back uh, from Europe when the war ended, but gave his life 
in sacrificial duty there. And we used to say this, speaking of schools, we used to memorize this as, as children. I'm sure that's not done now, but uh, just reflect on this for a moment. He wrote, in Flanders fields where poppies blow, between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunsets glow, loved, and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you with trembling hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to lift it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. We are the dead. The Bible uses that phrase as a word to describe you and I before we knew the Lord. That we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but brought to life because a good man died, a perfect man died, the Lamb of God paid for our sins on the cross. And for that reason, we move from dead to alive, from lost to found, from enemy to friend. And uh, so I'm going to lead us in a time of a confession of sins, and then I'll ask you if you've not yet uh, gotten your communion emblems, there's a cup of juice and a piece of bread over on the side tables. Uh, if Jesus Christ is Lord, if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to partake in this table with us this morning. Uh, but if you would, please read aloud with me uh, this uh, corporate time of confession of sins. Gracious and loving God, open our hearts so that we are able to admit you to fullness of our lives. That which is beautiful and good, that which is hurtful and hateful, we confess that we do not follow Jesus in all that we do. We love with condition, we judge and condemn, we cast the first stone and keep the logs in our own eyes. We do not turn to you as the source of our healing. Forgive us, we pray, forgive our sin, and empower us to be imitators of Christ in love and service. Amen. Uh, friends, please uh, grab your communion emblems and we'll continue in this time of remembrance. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Our great, almighty, faithful God, we come to worship you today, approaching your throne with confidence and bold access because we have been ransomed, purchased, bought by the shed blood of Christ on the cross. And so, Father, we confess our wrongdoings and sins to you. We thank you for redemption that can be known through calling on Christ in faith. And we thank you for this loaf and cup as we remember you and look forward to your return. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, saying, this is my body, take and eat. Jesus took the cup, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, hear the good news. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Let us proclaim the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Ask uh, Rob Brody now if he would come and share our scripture reading. And if you could stand for the reading of God's word, uh, Rob is going to read that, and he will see, say, this is the word of the Lord, and the congregation will respond, thanks be to God. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, 
nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, uh, Rob, for that. Uh, we now invite the children to go to their program. Uh, any children that wish to stay in the main service are also welcome uh, to stay, but uh, this is your time now if you'd like to be dismissed. I, I did say the program was for kids, right? <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Uh, we're in week four of our series, Jordan Peterson Goes to Church, a biblical look at the 12 rules of life. And as I said, just uh, as a caveat at the introduction of each one of these messages, uh, this is not an endorsement of Jordan Peterson so much as a, it is a look at uh, his ideas and thoughts and how they measure up biblically and how he can apply scripture to our lives that uh, embody these truths. Uh, you know, we're not uh, disciples of JP, we are disciples of JC, and it's the Lord Jesus that uh, ultimately we proclaim here at this church. Uh, the fourth chapter, though, of Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life is called Compare Yourself to Who You Were Yesterday, Not to Someone Else Today. Now, that's actually very good advice, isn't it? Uh, you and a friend decide together you're going to get in shape. You're going to exercise, eat right, cut the calories, going to do all the right things, really walk the line on this. And after six months, your friend is down 40 pounds, but you're only down 20 pounds, and you feel like a loser. But you lost 20 pounds. Why can't you celebrate? You started with humble beginnings, but you've always been competitive. After graduation, you and your buddies stayed in touch. You've got a great job that you love and all your bills are paid. Then you learn your friend Joe, who graduated with you, has a nicer house and a much better paying job. You wonder what you did wrong. Worse, you begin to harbor feelings of resentment uh, toward your own friend. What, what's going on? What's happening? It's an inaccurate assessment of yourself because you are comparing the wrong metrics. Hence, Peterson's admonition. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to, someone who, to, not to who someone else is today. And I'll just quote briefly from the beginning of chapter four. And he says this, and he's talking about the internal clinic, critic. It was easier for people to be good at something when more of us lived in small, rural communities. Someone could be homecoming queen. Someone else could be spelling bee champ, math whiz, or basketball star. There were only one or two mechanics and a couple of teachers. In each of their domains, these local heroes had the opportunity to enjoy the serotonin-fueled confidence of the victor. It may be for that reason that people who were born in small towns are statistically overrepresented among the eminent. If you're one in a million now, but originated in modern New York, there's 20 of you. And most of us now live in cities. What's more, we have become digitally connected to the entire seven billion. Our hierarchies of accomplishment are now dizzyingly vertical. No matter how good you are at something, or how you rank your accomplishments, there is someone out there who makes you look incompetent. You're a decent guitar player, but you're not Jimmy Page or Jack White. You've almost certainly, you're almost certainly not going to rock your local pub. You're a good cook, but there are many great chefs. Your mother's recipe for fish, fish heads and rice, no matter how celebrated in her village of origin, doesn't cut it in these days of grapefruit foam and scotch tobacco ice cream. Some mafia don has a tackier yacht. Some obsessive CEO has a more complicated self-winding watch kept in his more valuable mechanical hardwood and steel automatic self-winding watch case. Even the most stunning Hollywood actress eventually transforms into the evil queen on eternal paranoid watch for the new Snow White. And you, your career is boring and pointless. 
your housekeeping skills are second rate. Your taste is appalling. You're fatter than your friends, and everyone dreads your parties. Who cares if you're the Prime Minister of Canada when someone else is the President of the United States? So, this is good advice, but I think we can tease it out. I think we can actually perfect that statement by going to Scripture. So, uh, first, a few comments about our passage today. Many of you probably think that a preacher begins his sermon prep looking for a text that he's really excited about, looking for a text that, 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 that might fit a topic he wants to deal with or whatever. And so as I looked at this um, teaching that uh, compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today, and I was thinking about uh, scriptures that would speak to this in a clear and authoritative way, I kept coming up with this, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. And so I looked in commentaries. Uh, you know, now, I could have picked a, a text that, oh, the man born blind. I once was blind, but, but now I see. Or uh, the lost son. You know, the father says he was, he was dead, but now is alive. He was lost, and he is now found. But those aren't conjoined with um, the actions, the means that God has made for us to return to him. So those verses are all, um, they're great in, in, in the idea of coming back, but they're not tied to a theology of uh, what that looks like and what God has done for us. So uh, now and then, uh, a text finds me. You, you might say, uh, Jim, do you look for a text? And I would say an awful lot of times, a text simply finds me. And that would be true of this one. Uh, it's part of the reason why in recent years, I've begun preaching through books of the Bible, uh, one book at a time, chapter by chapter, uh, expositionally, because you don't get to pick what's in front of you that particular Sunday. It just is, and you have to deal with it. And I know that our text today includes uh, maybe a sense of judgment or condemnation. And I would suggest to you that it's the opposite of that. It's a text of hope that says, you know, no matter what you were or what you are, God has a plan and you can be better today than you were yesterday through Jesus Christ. And such were some of you. So there are words in this that are triggering in our society. And like I said, the text picked me. Uh, I didn't pick it. And my job as a pastor and a preacher of the word is not to make a text harder. My task is not to make a text softer. My task is simply to tell you the truth about what the Bible is saying here. And um, you can leave with that taught to you as the Bible teaches it and do with it in your own heart what you wish. My, my job as a preacher is to convey the word of God of you to you and not make it harder and not make it softer, but be as precise with the word of God as I can be. So, such were some of you. Such were some of you. So back to our, our, our text, we can, we can look at this and we can quickly identify some of the pitfalls of comparing of comparing. Let's look at what the Bible says. There's, there's several scriptures in a row uh, that I'd like you to look at after uh, point number one, which is compare yourself to who you were yesterday, uh, not to who someone else is today. But we're going to look at, at three scriptures and then observe uh, some of the pitfalls of comparing. So, uh, Galatians 6.4. I'll tell you what, why don't you try to read this? You've got an outline uh, you've got it on the screen. Why don't we try to read these three verses together with great enthusiasm, okay? Each one 
should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. That's Galatians 6.4. 2 Corinthians 10.12 says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend, that should say commend, themselves, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, and then 2 Corinthians 10, 17, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Okay, so three observations. First, comparison can lead to a sense of inadequacy. It's completely vain to compare yourself with somebody else because you'll always find somebody who's better at it. And even if they're not better at it, perhaps your own inner critic will tell you that they are. Uh, you just can't trust the comparison game. And you can't always trust that voice that, 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 that speaks to you from your own insecurities. And then second, in contrast to the first observation, uh, comparison can lead to a sense of pride a sense of pride. I mean, the, the, the most redeeming feature of this passage has in it is, but such were some of you. In other words, what has been done for us, who we were and who we are now, is nothing that we can boast in of ourselves, right? Uh, there, there's no self-righteousness, pride, or arrogance. There's no condescension involved in that as we guard, regard others who perhaps struggle with different sins than we've struggled with or people who are uh, completely lost in something that is, is destructive and harmful uh, for them. Uh, we are all guilty. We are all sinners, according to the word of God. And so sometimes, you know, we need this word to keep us from proudly raising ourselves above and look at me, look how much better I am, uh, look how terrible that person is. And uh, it's, it's not what we're looking for. Thirdly, comparison can lead to an inaccurate self-assessment. I think that pretty, summarize, pretty much summarizes the first two observations. We listen to the critic inside instead of attending to who Jesus says we are in Christ. The most important thing is, who does God say that I am? And what is the trajectory of my life by his grace and his spirit now. So don't listen to the critic inside. Don't listen to others. Listen to who Jesus says you are in Christ. Number two is this. In humility, remember your own conversion and the church's mission. I used to hear that word a lot about being converted. Uh, back in the day. I wonder if that word's also fallen out of favor. Maybe people just don't understand what it means, but it wasn't uncommon uh, a few decades ago for people to say to you, so tell me about how you were converted, or tell me about your conversion uh, to Jesus Christ. So in humility, remember your own conversion and the church's mission, because the two go lockstep side by side together. So listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So the church at Corinth was made up of people who were converted, converted from fornication, from idolatry, adultery, uh, effeminate sexual practice, homosexuality, thievery, covetousness, drunkenness, slander, extortion. That was a congregation of converted people. They'd been changed from these behaviors and these lifestyles, these besetting chronic sins. And that's what they were. They were converted people, and that's what every church is. It is a congregation of converted sinners. This passage is describing the collection of sinners that make up the church. They are all sinners, but they are converted sinners. And this is the message and the mission of the church in the world, to convert sinners. 
Governments can make laws all they want. They will never dictate to the church what its mission is. The mission of the church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that sinners might be converted. All kinds of sinners, every sinners, sinner like me, sinners like you. Just in case while we're talking about it, once we're such, watch, once some were some of you, I can identify with more than one characteristic uh, on that list that I participated in before I knew the Lord, before I was converted. And thank God I was brought a word of truth. I was brought the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Lord changed me. I was converted from the way I was walking. I repented, changed direction and began to walk in a new way. Now my sanctification continues and we'll get to that. But the church is in the world to convert sinners. In James chapter 5 and verse 20, we read, He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. I want to read that again. He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. And death, being spoken of there, is eternal death, meaning hell. So our mission is to convert sinners. That's what we do. That's why we exist in the world. We are not first a charitable organization. We are not a moral organization in the world. We are not trying to make people better by some kind of behavioral instruction. We exist in the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that sinners can be converted, transformed, and discipled. The greatest man who had ever lived up until his time was John the Baptist. And that's what Jesus said about him, the greatest man who ever lived up to his time, the last of the Old Testament prophets and the forerunner of our Lord. When the angel came to announce that he would be born, the message from heaven regarding John the Baptist was this, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. That's conversion. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. In the Old Testament, David, who was a great sinner, a great sinner, confessed his sin in the penitent tones of Psalm 51. It's an agonizing psalm to read because David is honest about his wretchedness. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had seen to it that her husband was actually killed. A great, great sinner. And in the remorse of his sin, he cries out to God to forgive him and to create in him a clean heart. And in Psalm 51 and verse 13, David said, if you will do this, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Converted. David knows what every converted sinner knows, what you know, that you were saved so that you could help convert other sinners. David says, create in me a clean heart. And I will teach the transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. The early church had one commission. Go and make disciples. The conversion of sinners. And as the apostles went out to preach the gospel to the nations, for the first time in the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, they came back to report what was happening. And we read in chapter 15 of Acts and verse 3 that Paul and Barnabas came to the brethren in Jerusalem. And verse 3 says, Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. The conversion of the Gentiles. And, and we're bringing great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they came back to give a mission report, they were describing the conversion of Gentiles. Down in verse 19 of the same chapter, Acts 15, therefore it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. They went out into the Gentile nations who had no perception, no understanding of Christian truth, who had for the most part no understanding of the Old Testament, which was the only existing scripture, no understanding of the gospel. They confronted them with their lostness and their sin for the very purpose of conversion and transformation. An illustration of that occurred, for example, in the city of Thessalonica. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we read, read this, verse 9. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you. That was with the people in Thessalonica. And how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is just Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Paul went to Thessalonica. He preached the gospel. They turned from, to God from idols and thereby were rescued from eternal damnation and wrath. And that is what the church does in the world. You know, sadly, there's much confusion about the purpose of the church because, uh, again, ma many, many churches want to, that they prefer a, a therapeutic approach rather than a gospel approach. And uh, they don't stick with the mission. Many of them don't seem to care about it. The, there are plenty of churches today that are ordaining people who need to be converted before they're ordained. And that hasn't happened. To illustrate the reality of conversion, we go back to our text of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And Paul gives us very clear instruction. In fact, it's so clear, it's almost obvious. And that's why he begins by saying in verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And there's a certain amount of uh, incredulity in that, right? You would think for a moment that, of course, you know, nobody would be foolish enough to assume the unrighteous could enter the kingdom of God, only those one who is righteous, who is holy. The kingdom of God does not belong to those who are unrighteous. And if you are unrighteous, you have no part in the kingdom of God. And that's a foundational truth that cannot be misunderstood or changed. We'll get to the good news because although we are unrighteous, we are made righteous through Christ and, and we're getting that. Now, what do we mean by the kingdom of God? Well, we mean the sphere of salvation where Christ rules over those who have been redeemed through the work of Christ on the cross. And the kingdom of God is made up of the converted, not the unconverted. So the purpose of the church in proclaiming the kingdom of God and the salvation that gives you entrance into the kingdom is to preach the gospels that converts sinners so that they can enter the kingdom. And you look at this list, it's a representative list, okay? It's not an exhaustive list. You could add other categories of sins, but it starts with fornicators, that's porneia, from which we get the word por pornography. And that's just general sexual immorality of any kind. If you, if you cared to talk about pornography, uh, which this message is not about, there are enough statistics that indicate that this has become a major problem for both men and women in the church. And Fornicators is a broadly encompassing word uh, to, to illustrate or to define general immorality of any of that kind. Idolaters, it names. Idolaters are not in the kingdom because they're worshiping other than God or something other than God that, that's false religion. Adulterers are not in the kingdom. Adultery means the violation of marital codes, marital pledges, marital covenants, violation of marriage vows. They're not in the kingdom. Thieves are not in the kingdom. Drunkards are not in the kingdom. Revilers or slanderers are not in the kingdom. Swindlers or extortioners, con men, criminals, etc., are not in the kingdom. It uses the term the effeminate here. In many translations, it blends the word effeminate with the word homosexual. In the original language, uh, they are two distinct terms. What does effeminate include? Well, it's the word malakos. It means soft, like soft clothing, uh, but used in a sexual sense. It refers to the, the passive partner 
in a homosexual relationship or the transvestite, the cross-dresser, or the transgender person, or the male prostitute, or the eunuch, the one who offers himself to the aggressive homosexual. And homosexual, that's the word arsenokoites from two words, which just means man and bed. Someone who goes to bed with a man. Man in bed with a, a man. So you have really broad terms here. And there's nothing about this list that says one is particularly worse than the other. The list exists to show that we all stand as unrighteous sinners before a righteous God. And without God's intervention on our part and are receiving that gift through faith, we are lost for eternity. Now, as I said, it's, it's, it's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. It's a representative list. And such were some of you. Well, that gets me. Such were some of you. Because I know it. I'm not going to argue with this. I know it. Such was I. Past tense. Such were some of you. And again, this is not intended to be exhaustive. It's not intended to, to list every category, but it is supposed to be specific. It's specific to the church it was addressed to. It's specific to hit the hearts of the Corinthians. The power of sin is seen in the multifaceted uh, element of sinful behavior. And most of the sins on these lists are obvious moral transgressions. Now, unfortunately to our mainstream culture, they are seen less as sin and more as just normal, transformative human behavior. But the Bible calls us back to the way God designed us, to what he created to be, right and true and good. And while these are common to humanity, they are a distortion. They are not in line with God's original design and intent. And every last one of these reflect fallen, sinful humanity, which, by the way, is every one of us, okay? Apart from Christ. There is no sense in which we can look at this and say that somehow these sins are worse than others. The Word of God would have us look at our own hearts and see that our own hearts have been characterized by sin, have been perverted and defined by sinful behavior. But those are the things by the grace of God that no longer define who we are. They no longer define who I am. That's part of what Paul wants to show the church. This is not who you are. This doesn't have to define you as an individual. Find your identity in Jesus Christ because your identity ultimately is defined by what you worship. You are what you worship. You will become what you worship. What you most cherish, what you most value will begin to shape you and begin to define your life. And what you worship is ultimately seen in the various expressions of your sinful behavior. The thing that you love most, that you worship the most, will begin to change your behavior in specific ways. So, for example, if I worship pleasure, then sexual Immorality might well be a problem in my life. Paul draws this out, the, the, the sexually immoral. Here the word specifically means uh, sex before marriage. That's included in fornication. If I worship pleasure, then adultery becomes a very real reality. Maybe if not in deed and thought, but other expressions of sexuality that oppose God's design and purposes. If I worship possessions... Listen, that, that, that I'm willing to potentially steal or to be ruled by greed, by covetousness, to abuse others, to step on others, to slander them. You know, I'll do what I need to do in order to get on top. Revilers and slanderers, the temptation to use people toward my own ends. And ultimately, in all of these examples, I become the person I worship most. The point is that I will not be defined by what God wants, that stubbornness, but what I want. And the perversion of sin defines us. We are all fundamentally sinners who refuse to worship God, and we are all as such, the Bible says, we were all such as this, 
Paul himself tells us that we are alienated from God. So again, I'll just re restate this. All sinners need to be converted. Right there in the Corinthian church, right here at Emmaus church, and every church I've served, I know personally people have been, who have been converted out of every one of these categories. Many of you in this church, some of you, he says, all of you, really were outside the kingdom of God, alienated, hopeless sons of hell, children of wrath. Me, once I was dead, now I am alive. Once I was blind, now I see. Once I was lost, now I'm found. Once I was filthy, now I'm clean. Once I was an alien, now I'm a citizen. Once I was an orphan, now I am a son. Once I was outside the family, now I have an inheritance. Number three, celebrate what God has done for you. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Some of you, he says, all of you really, were outside the kingdom of God, alienated, hopeless sons of wrath, but you were washed. And that's number one in your notes. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Amazing statement. So he uses these three words to describe it. And it's such a thorough conversion. This is not therapy. This is not a process. This is a divine event that takes place in a divine moment. It's something that had already happened to them. It wasn't in process. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. A decisive event in which Jesus washed sanctified, and justified you and me, the hopeless sinner. Three words. First of all, if you're a sinner, you need to be washed. And it's a compound verb. It means washed thoroughly, scrubbed, washed down to the bone, deep cleaning. No matter what the category of your sin, you come to Christ and you will be washed if you would like to observe the remaining verses under this point on your outline, Titus 3, 5, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clear from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Acts 22, 16, and now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on your name. So he says, you are washed. You have been scrubbed. Your sins have been removed. You appear before Jesus Christ as one who once was unrighteous, but now completely righteous, shining in white robes. You're, you're, you're righteous in the Lord's eyes. And then two, you are sanctified. Sanctified in truth. John 17, 17 says there in your notes, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So once all the filth is washed away, the Lord will plant his holy presence in your life. And then you'll be number three, justified. He will declare you righteous. You say, well, how did I get righteous so fast? I mean, I was just this and now I'm that. How did I get righteous so fast? Because God will credit to your account his own righteousness. That's conversion. That's why we exist. And no government will ever make any law that will stop the true church from being in the business of converting sinners. You can be washed, which includes complete forgiveness. You can be sanctified, which includes being a new creation, becoming holy, as it were, holy day by day, and you've become justified. Not in a process, not in a therapy. It's a divine miracle when you trust in Christ, when you trust in his name. And it's the work of the Spirit. Now, 
How dramatic was this conversion? Well, let's go back to chapter 1, and we'll end there. How dramatic was the change? Chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints, saints by calling. So what did those slanderers, revilers, thieves become? According to Scripture, saints. That's how complete the conversion is. It's divine. It's a miraculous transformation. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, whatever your category of sin, Christ can convert you into a saint. Washing all the filth away, giving you a holy new life, covering you with his own everlasting perfect righteousness. And that is the message of the gospel. That's truly the message of the gospel on the cross. God made him sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He who had no sin made sin so that in him you and I may become the righteousness of God. For, for some of you today, he offers hope. Because it's, it's not I once was now for you. For some of you, it might be I currently am. I currently am bound up in these things. I currently am defined by the behavior described there. But what's true of you now does not have to be true of you anymore. And this morning I can say with a heart full of gratitude, I once was all those things that are true of you, now don't have to be true of you. This very sec second you can turn to Christ. You can look to Christ, and you can see the one who was crucified in your place. You can see your, your sin and repent of them and turn to him. You can have life, and you can be among those who inherit the kingdom of God. See him in your place if you find yourself lost or devastated or ruined by sin. See him in your place. See him defeating the power of sin. See him damning the penalty of sin. See him doing it all for you. An act of love. There may be some of you today who acknowledge you're, you're living like the Corinthians. You name yourself as a follower of Christ, but you've been living like you're not. You look at the cross, and it's not making much difference in your life. And today is the day. Maybe God is calling you back to turn back once again. To turn in repentance anew and faith. To look at the cross and be reminded of the magnitude of the cost of your salvation and of the radically different life God has called you and empowered you to live. Some of you this morning just need to be reminded in a comforting and hopeful way that as you turn back to Jesus, he welcomes you with open arms. That's who I once was, but, that's no, but that is no longer who I will choose to be. And for those who are walking faithfully, coming back to this truth is never a choreography. It's always a joy to come back to the Lord. That's who I once was. That list is me, that list is you. And thanks be to God, you are washed, justified, sanctified through Jesus Christ our Lord. So maybe now and then, it's not a bad idea to remember who you once were. Instead of comparing yourself to somebody else, or where you think you should be. To look at where you once were and remember to celebrate what was done on your behalf and mine. We're washed, justified, sanctified. God is good. God us pray. Father, we are grateful for your word, for the truth that it brings, for the hope that it gives. We pray that we might walk in this truth, 
that we might know in our heart of hearts that we have truly been washed, that we have truly been sanctified, that we have truly been justified. And Father, you have made a way for us to go from death to life. We praise your name, and we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Judge and our defense.